OK, everyone, sorry for the slightly delayed start um, for this session. We have, as you might guess, some technical difficulties going on behind the scenes, but we are all here now. And so I am delighted, everyone, to welcome you to this, the second Leonardo Laser Talk to be held in Australia, convened a series convened by my colleague, Associate Professor Grayson Cook from Southern Cross University and myself, and I'm Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens from the University of Queensland. So I'm joining you tonight from Mianjin, Brisbane, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the, the lands on which I'm standing tonight, the Turrbal and Yugara people. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their, to their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We have a slightly distributed format for tonight as we're meeting virtually. And so tonight's meeting is held at the Home of the Arts on the Gold Coast. So I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugambe language region, the traditional owners of this country. I pay my respect to their elders past and present, and I'd like to extend an especially warm welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us this evening. So this is the second of the Leonardo Laser Talk series that Grayson and I have hosted together in this first series to be held in Australia. We're super excited to have been able to have launched this series uh, just uh, in June of this year with the support of Leonardo Journal and the International Society for the Arts, Sciences and Technology. For those of you who aren't familiar with this series of talks, LASER um, is actually an acronym um, and it stands for Leonardo, the journal, Art Science Evening Rendezvous. And so it's an Art Science Evening Rendezvous that we have in store for you this evening. Tonight's talk is part of an international program of gathering that brings artists, scientists and other scholars and the public together for presentations, performances and conversations. And we have a really amazing contribution to that program ahead for us this evening. So I'm going to hand over to Grayson in just a moment who will introduce tonight's talks, the topic of tonight and our two fabulous speakers. But firstly, I would just like to extend my most heartfelt appreciation to the team at the Home of the Arts on the Gold Coast, especially to Brent and to Sarah for helping us transform tonight's event into a virtually a fully virtual seminar, really on a moment's notice. A number of us who are participating participating tonight are participating from full lockdowns in our various location, as is HODA itself. So we are particularly mindful to everyone who is able to join us um, tonight, and we are particularly keen to enjoy this, fabu um, this fabulous conversation that we're about to have, albeit at a safe distance from one another. So let me hand you over now um, to my dear colleague, Grayson Cook, who's going to introduce our wonderful speakers and who will chair tonight's session, and I will rejoin you at question time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. And, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm Grayson Cook. I'm, I'm with Elizabeth. Very excited to be um, convening and chairing tonight's session. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which this event is being broadcast and received. Um, I'm speaking to you from beautiful Nyangbul country um, in northern New South Wales, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I really want to thank Leonardo for supporting the series of talks in Australia um, and a huge thank you to Hodder, the staff, for supporting my pitch um, some months ago that, 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 that we do a joint uh, the SCU, UQ, Leonardo, Hotter talk. Um, it was, as Elizabeth mentioned, going to be um, a full house of, of in-person attendees and a raft of online people as well. Um, and our, our nations and our world's many misfortunes have, have, have once again um, got in the way. Uh, but here we are, and, and I'm really excited that, that, that we're going to present, I, I think, a slightly adjusted um, format than, than we would have otherwise done in, in, in person. Um, it, it's fair to say that speaking to a live audience um, frames what how you might speak and show um, and, and do a presentation in a certain way and the online context does change that a little bit so in a way we've moved from 
formal presentations to something a little closer to um, briefer presentations and discussion. And I hope that it'll still be an engaging discussion um, around the wonderful topic of plant thinking, listening and feeling um, as our engagement with impact upon and, and insights into the more than hu human world kind of advance at the moment in, 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 in theory and practice in the arts and sciences, I think we're at a really important moment and the opportunity to have an artist and a scientist who both are really strongly invested in this question of our relationship with plants and, and, and the concept of, of, of plant thinking and of, and of plant expression um, and their rich interaction with, with human cultures and civilizations, this is a real pleasure. So um, I'm very excited to introduce firstly our first speaker who will be Monica Galliano. Um, Monica is a research associate professor in evolutionary ecology. She's a former fellow of the Australian Research Council. She's research associate professor adjunct at, at UWA. Um, she's a member of the Sydney Environment Institute, and she's also based at Southern Coast University, where she directs the, uh, the Biological Intelligence Lab as part of the Diverse Intelligences Initiative, of the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And her work has extended the concept of co cognition in plants. Her latest book, Thus Spake the Plant, is available. And our second speaker, um, who has also worked with Monica at, at various instances, is Danny Zavala. And Danny is a, is a curator and artist whose work explores the agency of non-human others. She's the artistic co-director of Liquid Architecture, the National Sound Art Organization. And in that context, she's helped generate a context for artists working with sound and listening, developing research-based investigations into sonic phenomena, sound as a social currency, and political acts of listening. And since 2018, she has been working on a curatorial project, Why Listen to Plants, which encompasses exhibitions, performances, workshops, publications, and um, educational curriculum. As an artist, her Seaweed Society project cultivates an appreciation for seaweed from a queer ecology perspective, and her Orchid House project listens from the, from, from the perspective of endangered species. I'm, I'm really excited to, um, to to have you both here speaking to us, and I'd like to kick things off by passing over to Monica to um, make the first presentation. Thank you so much. Um, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Grayson, for inviting me, and uh, very excited to um, join Danny who I haven't seen in a while and is very excited to be able to, you know, share these, even if it's not in person as I was expecting and it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess uh, what I'm going to share is uh, some of the most recent work that I've been doing uh, in the context of my uh, scientific research with um, choices and decision making in plants, which is part of the cognitive realm for plants. And um, the what I'm about to share with you is actually a failed experiment, really. So, um, but out of the failure or apparent failure, what uh, I had to learn was that um, I was in collaboration with others and these were non-humans, these were my plants themselves, as well as the space that the uh, experiment apparently was taking place into. And um, so the, the, the study was very simple. I already um, ran some experiments previously showing that um, pea plants are able to detect the vibration underground and they can tell based on the sound of water where water is. And, um, and they will direct their roots to it. So the initial experiments showing this was very simple and the peas had to just choose either go to the water or go away from the water. So I decided to complicate things a little and create a, a maze that was more difficult, I, I thought it was more difficult to solve. And, um, and you would see what uh, it would look like if you were um, running an experiment like this, which would be using uh, infrared cameras, because of course roots um, live in the dark of the soil. And, uh, and so in the video that you're about to show, you will see these, uh, the pea root uh, 
reaching um, downwards towards us from the surface into the soil. And what you are watching is how the, uh, the pea root um, is exploring the soil and deciding which way to go. And it's got four different options, but only one is the right one. Well, according to my experiment. So in the video that is going to uh, play in a second, um, you will see uh, there is a little star in one of the arms of the of the maze. And, uh, and you will see how um, the pea root comes down and then after a little bit of exploration, like where do I go, where do I go? It will uh, direct itself to the branch that has got the little star, which is um, the correct choice to make because that was the branch or the corner of the experimental setup that had the sound of uh, recorded sound of water. And as you can see, the the pea root slowly, slowly is making its way. This is infrared recordings and there are time lapse. So there be, you know, this is already a fast speed up version of what a pea would do. Um, why is this interesting? Because as you can see the setup, the pea has four different choices. And uh, in the first couple of runs that I did, the pea was showing and I was so happy as a scientist having the question and posing the, the restriction within the experimental setup. I was very happy to see that the peas were selecting the arm with the sound of water out of the four. So this is a, a much refined um, decision making, a much refined choice compared to what I've seen before in the previous experiment that I ran. But then something, there was a twist in the story. And what happened was that when I moved the speakers in other corners of the of the maze, the peas seem to still go to that direction. And, uh, and this happened as a collective. So we have, you know, different peas individually positioned in their own individual mazes, and they all seem to select the same branch, the same direction, no matter what I do. And so, of course, I started questioning, well, I know that they can hear the sound of water, but obviously there is something else in the environment that they are tuned in, and I can't tell what it is. And um, and of course, this is the, the worst nightmare for a scientist because uh, we are trained to control every single possible uh, interference. And here we go, something is happening. The peas know exactly that is something that they are interested in and they're showing me with their behavior. And yet I have no idea what it is that they're after. So the experiment was uh, taking place inside a, a, a laboratory space. And eventually, after many days of like uh, banging my head against the wall, thinking what's going on and how can I control this? I had to release control and I had to really observe what the peas are trying to tell me and what are the choices, the choices that are made trying to show. And what they were trying to say was, um, well, we obviously make choices. So if you wanted to know whether we plants can make choices and we can make decisions, here you go, you got your answer. But like for us humans and other animals, of course, choice and decision making is much more complex than just the final result. How you get there is the important bit. And so the entire experiment changed and got reinvented multiple times. Materials that were used for the experiment were invented and reinvented and changed and thrown away and uh, multiple times. And in the end, the experimental question became irrelevant because um, it was what became more relevant to me was the fact that I was um, being invited by the plants themselves to be part of the experiment. And I was, whether I liked it or not, but in this way, that it was a really obvious invitation that you are part of the experiment because you're the one observing and deciding a priori what is supposed to be and what I'm going to do, the plant, I'm going to show you that there are other ways. And, uh, and if you're interested really in understanding my decision making as a plant, then you have to come and, and have a little uh, play with me. And, and uh, you know, I'm the one making the rules this time. And so, of course, as the plant's dictator changes, um, and I implemented the changes in the experimental design and everything. The entire relationship also changed. So we went from inside a lab to an outside greenhouse that I had to build on purpose to be able to continue the experiment. 
And then even then the material, the, the maze got simplified back to two because that was actually a more appropriate way of approaching the question. So um, this is the worst nightmare for a scientist because we are trained to, first of all, of course, control, but also uh, we are supposed to be the knowers. We are supposed to be the one holding the knowledge and discovering knowledge. And instead, it, I was humbly reminded that uh, the knowledge is, uh, is not discovered, it's in the making, and the knowledge sits in the relationship, not in the specifics of who is what and whatever, who is doing what. And so the knowledge is not for me to discover or to um, take. Uh, science produces knowledge, uh, but the knowledge itself, um, it became very clear to me, knowledge, it's not a, a thing that we can grasp. And it's more of a process that we are part of. And if we're lucky enough, then we also gain some wisdom out of it. <laughs> um, and I might leave it there, so because of course I know there are lots of big themes in this conversation, and I want to make sure Dani's got some time to put her thing in there at the spinning. <laughs> so Dani, if you want to take it, or yours. Oh, thank, thank you, Monica. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Am I, are you hearing me? All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, it's. You know, uh, I would rather you just kept talking, um, but the sooner I get my talk done, the sooner we can get back to our conversation. So um, please, I'm just opening my tray now. Um, how's that going as far as the presentation goes? Sounding and looking okay, yeah? Fingers and you can hear me okay, all right. Um, so um, let me begin with my acknowledgement. I'm on the lands of the Yugambe and Banjalung people um, on the border of the Southern Gold Coast. The lands and waters are their traditional home and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I uh, am so excited to be sharing a space here with Monica. Um, Again, it feels like it was only yesterday that we did a project right here at Hora um, in the same uh, space. Um, but the most exciting uh, thing is that I, I can now kind of connect that project through with uh, some other artistic and curatorial projects for you. So um, if I am to freeze, uh, by the way, or the um, there is a problem with the the broadcast can someone call me or text me on my phone because while I'm full screen for you I can't see. Um, so I've just put a little bit of a presentation together to, to respond a little bit to some of Monica's themes but also place uh, my journey from curator to artist and uh, the kind of role of plants and plant thinking in that. Um, so yes I'm a research curator um, which means that my uh, I work with my research PhD um, which is in art history to produce programs uh, as a curator and now uh, as an artist for many many years I worked at Liquid Architecture, the Sound Art Organisation as Artistic Director uh, with Joel Stern and have transitioned now into the research curatorial role. I'm still very involved in uh, sound art, but um, much more involved um, now in making artwork, which is what we're going to get to today. To get to talking about uh, the big program, I Listen to Plants, the one that connected me and Monica uh, together in the first place, um, I actually have to go back to 2016 uh, and tell you a little bit about a program called Why Listen to Animals, uh, because this is really where um, the, this investigation started for me, this idea of non-humans and listening to non-humans. Um, and the, the title was a play on a really famous um, art history essay called uh, Why Look at Animals, part of John Berger's Ways of Seeing, which kind of revolutionised art history in the 70s and was a big part of kind of turn towards critical thinking and critical theory. And uh, this essay asks why we look at animals and it's sort of the 
answer that Berger works towards is um, that they've become distanced from us as through a process of industrialization and capitalism. So early folk um, had no need to place themselves uh, inside a zoo to look at animals because they live side by side with them. And it's that, that growing distance um, that has led to this lack of, of comprehension uh, from on both sides. And Berger actually calls that the abyss of incomprehension. Um, and so from that, we kind of opened out into the idea of non-human subjectivity. There's a quote on your screen there, which I won't read from uh, one of the kind of key post-humanist thinkers um, who started the, this kind of, there was a big turn uh, at this point, sort of from the mid 2010s onwards that we started connecting in with. And so we've had lots of ways that that program was realized over many months in Melbourne in 2016. One of them was this performance that you can see a little bit of here, uh, traditional whale calling performance from Uncle Bana Lori from the Murnung people was a way for us of, of uh, bringing an uh, Indigenous frame to open that program for listening to animals and, and animal sounds. I, uh, by the end of 2016, 2017, we started uh, working into another investigation and early in 2017 I was very pleased to be able to officially call it Why Listen to Plants because I totally hadn't been reading about or thinking about plants and plant sound for many months before uh, the program launched. No, I was very, very lucky to be able to spend several months digging into this uh, amazing history of plant sound and uh, uh, this kind of process of um, reaching the point where Monica is at now, but through a lot of early kind of experiments of tuning into plants' electrophysiological systems uh, and this kind of very literal listening to the sounds that plants might be making in the hope of kind of forming some kind of connection, some kind of interspecies connection. You can see some of this gorgeous 70s technology. It goes back a lot further than that, the kind of history of these human uh, attempts to interface across that, across that abyss uh, of incomprehension. Um, and uh, there's certainly a lot of people out there making uh, today, even making uh, music, electronic music, the sort of area I work in with plant sound. Um, and there's a lot of places where that goes into even more uh, esoteric, I guess you could say, connections between plants and, and consciousness. Um, and it is part of a wonderful but also very thorny and complex debate um, across the worlds of art and science about uh, the degree to which plants um, could be said to be sentient, to, could be conscious if they are sensing others and their environment, if they're communicating with others and other species. Um, the finer points of the debate about whether we should or shouldn't call it language when non-humans dare to communicate with each other, not using English uh, or, or mouths or, or ears or things like that. Um, and I grew to become very interested in some of these ethical questions around forcing the plants to make sound or speaking for the sound, the, the plants themselves. These echo a lot of the debates in art uh, history and more broadly in um, um, uh, you know, political theory about the idea of speaking for the subaltern, for instance, speaking for those who are oppressed or in some ways have a, a you know, a, you know, in a power imbalance with us, um, as well as uh, kind of political ideas of the voice. You know, we, we've conflated the idea of having a voice with political agency for so long. Uh, but if that's not a voice we can hear, uh, you know, what are the politics of the translation? What are the ethics of working with these uh, beings who may or may not be able to consent? Well, th they, they can't consent. But not really a question about that, but is it okay uh, to, to, to perform these kind of experiments on them? And so these kind of ethics uh, questions as well um, as also, you know, the curatorial questions of how do I put this in a gallery? How do I put this in an art museum? How do I, you know, put this in a public program? Um, so this is what then gave birth to this massive program uh, in uh, starting in 2017 and then driving into 2018 while I listened to plants. So what I thought I'd just really quickly do for you um, in the remaining little bit of time here now is rip through that program uh, via this amazing figure of Monica Galliani because there were so many texts and so many thinkers and so much that went into that program. But at the end of the day, it came back to her 
it was about her uh, and uh, she was the, the star of uh, quite a few of the programs, which was extremely fortunate for us. I actually, in the process of putting this talk together, went back through my old uh, emails and chats with my co-director, Joel Stern, and there's an email from April where I said, Joel, you know Monica, who I've been going on about, she has a new book coming out and it's called Why Listen to Plants? No, it's called uh, uh, Thus Spoke the Plants and it's going to be in our program and there's just like so much excitement coming off the screen from hearing that there's someone uh, working in the same way of um, across a, the art science divide, if you like. And so Monica's uh, work, uh, some essays in the language of plants and a book of uh, anthology she's put together as well as Thus Spoke the Plant became um, a really um, kind of touchstone throughout the whole program. And one of those was this sort of sense that Monica was kind of intimating it before of this letting go of not necessarily knowing how it might happen, trying to use some of those teachings uh, that come through in this this book of Monica's. If you are interested, I really, really recommend you have a read. It's it's pretty special. There's, there's a few copies floating around out there. So one of the things things uh, we wanted to do when we put this Why Listen to Plants program together was have some um, as many activities where people could kind of be out and hearing from different types of experts uh, in the field and so we were lucky enough to be able to do some programs in Berlin. We did a forage and a couple of performances in a park called Hasenheide which is kind of famous grotty but beautiful park in the middle of Berlin um, and we also did a big performance event at um, uh, a, a beautiful gallery called Errant Sound um, and we found this mushroom that looks so much like an ear. Can you believe that? It's like literally like an ear. I was like, oh my god, you were so meant to be the hero image for the forage. Um, and we had uh, dumplings and soup and we had um, beautiful Korean artist Sun Jim there who took us through a kind of like experimental uh, material listening project and then uh, by the time we got to the gallery, um, the works were kind of more based around sound and electronic music, uh, as well as a literal conversation with a the plant. There on the left, Mikiko Yamamoto uh, did a kind of meditation where she spoke to and with uh, some different plants. Um, Felicity Mangan uh, and Christina Ertel Shirley mic'd up some plants uh, with their ele uh, electric um piezo receptors, so you, they were sort of processing that sound for their music performance. And Nathan Gray on the right of your screen there wrote a really beautiful lecture performance uh, forecasting a world where the plants have taken over after a kind of apocalyptic event and the, um, the, the way in which those plants might structure a world where they're, they're the boss. Um, the station is in the process, that, that work of his has been in the process of being turned into a publication. So I don't want to give too much away about that. Um, moved on to Norway from Berlin where the questions of, of plant sound uh, started to need to be put into a gallery and have a way of kind of categorizing and dealing uh, with artists working with plants and sound and listening somehow. Um, and the types of works that we were included were only audio works, which is pretty weird and brave in a gallery. Uh, but we had a, such a beautiful array of different works ranging from a Sami work that was from the perspective of a berry uh, with a reindeer approaching to um, a really beautiful work by Laurie Anderson um, that was from the perspective of a flower uh, having a bee come to land on it. Um, and what I ended up doing that that was separating the, the the types of works into two kinds. One is sort of literal and using the sound of the plant itself, and I call that music by plants. Uh, and the second half was more music made in sympathy for plants or in a dialogue with them or in some ways made for them. Um, and it's also the first uh, event uh, I've ever done where my acknowledgements included a list of plants. It was all the plants that were mentioned in any of the works, as well as the supplements we were taking to get through the project. So that's what you're looking at there, the list of all those beautiful plants. This is how we installed it in a couple of greenhouses. Uh, we figured it would create a nice, cosy listening space and give people a chance to sit and uh, choose either the music for plants um, greenhouse or the music by plants greenhouse. Um, we had a lot of people come through and enjoy 
uh, there listening, um, as well as dealing with some of those pragmatic issues of sound in the gallery, you know, leaking leaking out of places. So then came back to Australia, uh, and it was time to do uh, the the projects here. Um, and these programs took on a kind of more of a systems based approach. The uh, why listen to plants in Brisbane? We did at Botanic Gardens at um, Mount Cutha, and um, we had a beautiful gathering of people, lots of amazing local artists, some delicious tea by mutual making you can see there on the right of the screen Caitlin and Dana um, uh, lots of musical performances listening to roots with Leah Barclay incredible figure who should be mentioned in all of this as well uh, as a reading from Monica from the book um, and oh my god that was one of the best moments of my life look at that Leah there defocused but beaming on the left of your screen and Monica reading this really meaningful passage from the book um, we also went on a walk through the hot house uh, and listened to a whole lot of different colonized plants calling out in their own language in an amazing work by Libby Harwood. Um, and uh, then the following day, we did an, another little work um, at Spring Hill Reservoirs as part of the Rights of Nature, um, you know, move towards uh, considering uh, non-human others as uh, in terms of personhood or, or legal status um, and we did this underground in the Spring Hill Reservoirs and had an, a couple of different works that were kind of engaging with the seeking of water um, as well as becoming uh, a body of water beautiful uh, meditation by Jake Harkery uh, took us into that kind of like headspace for some um, you know, fairly serious, deep subterranean listening. Uh, and then we came to the Gold Coast uh, and there's Mon Monica again sitting reading from uh, the book um, and it was a beautiful day here at Hotto sitting underneath the ficus trees um, and listening to different trees. We listened to some native, non-native species as well as some uh, mangroves and uh, listened to them in their environment, went on a kayak tour and explored the, the waterways uh, and also um, had a chance to kind of think in a very local way about the plants um, that matter uh, here on the Gold Coast or Southeast Queensland, Northern Rivers, um, and what uh, those relationships are between habitat development, uh, feature plants, um, and um, also all of those kind of like changing ecologies in this constructed world we're kind of uh, living in and, and, and what the listening might be needed for that. Uh, we also had, I think, one of the world's only performances of Plant Drag by artist David Spooner, looking somewhat amazing there in the philodendron leaves, uh, and uh, lots of other beautiful things, mutual making, also made teas, and we had uh, some drawing workshops with seeds. Um, Another naughty man in a plant, even a little bit naughtier than the one before, that's an image from a Jeng Bo um, work that I curated into the Melbourne show. Now, the Melbourne show is extremely different to all the other shows we've done so far. Uh, it was another gallery installation, which we worked with moving image works that were um, related. And then we had a huge performance program over six weeks, no, eight weeks, uh, tying in a whole lot of different venues. And being Melbourne also, um, we didn't uh, make it about plants. It was called Why Listen to Plants, but it was, it branched out in every possible direction to look at plants as partners uh, and systems and interrelationships and interdependencies. Um, and at this point, um, I was getting uh, fairly into this kind of idea that we're all multiple. And so not only is the plant a subject, but we ourselves are not a singular subject. In fact, we're made of microbes, we're part microbes. Um, and for that reason, we're not all human. So the, for me, this, this kind of slide through this thinking about non-human agency uh, uh, was, um, this is the program that kind of really broke that open. Can we talk about plants without flowers without talking about bees? Can we talk about certain kinds of orchids without talking about their fungal partners? No, we, we, we can't. So that's how this program um, how this program ended up emerging. Um, there's a picture of the performance event that we opened with. Uh, as you can imagine, there was something huge, like 58 artists and 100 and something performances. I can't show you all of them. 
Um, I will show you a, another program that kind of messed with my stable categories right after we did Wireless into Plants in Melbourne. Uh, we did Wireless into Bees. Um, and why this was so messy was because Joel was like, oh, well, it's obviously part of Wireless into Animals. So I was like, no, no, it's an extension of Wireless into Plants. And he's like, they're bees, Danny, they're animals. And I'm like, no, no, it's, but it's about the whole partnerships. And we, if we're talking about plants, we can't ignore the bee crisis. Anyway, um, Wireless into Bees now sits under both investigations technically in its categorization. There we are listening to hives and the artists at the very front there, Lily Halls made a beautiful work, uh, listening to different hives of different types of health. Um, you, you can hear in this kind of electronic music drone piece that she's put together, you can hear the humming. There's certainly really different sounds, uh, really obvious inside a hive uh, based around their sound alone. We did lots of other things. We had performances and we had delicious cakes with honey and uh, poetry and then walk and a forage. But the actual straight up listening to the hives part was was pretty amazing on this um, permaculture farm um, in um, in Dalesford. Uh, and there's also work, sorry about the quality of that, uh, but I wanted to just to mention A, it has an orchid, and B, it's by Kadisha Carroll, who is was just magically in town at that time. Um, she's a really big figure in the whole non-human um, subjectivity field and a really important writer who wrote a book called Botanical Drift, which is also kind of historicizing this plant turn um, in the arts. So I was very honored to have her as a performer. She had her work here where the orchid was looked like it was speaking into a mic as it delivered this kind of whispered monologue about how misunderstood it was, how it wasn't actually trying to trick those wasps uh, because it did give them pollen and uh, things like that. So really another amazing work. Give anything to be able to show that again, especially up here. Um, we're now in 2019 and I have recovered from the 2018 Why Listen to Plants extravaganza. Um, plants are semi taking a backseat, although I am now starting another project uh, on non-human language where I'm planning to speak and uh, make you know works. And this uh, that project, I was we were getting ready uh, to deliver a performance in, Nor uh, in Norway and in Poland where I would have done a lecture performance, but um, other things that happened in 2019 while well, listening to animals got a little rerun with the cuttlefish trip that I did and that was also where uh, I and and this uh, this particular point was where the eth the questions around ethics and kind of trying to listen to others and what their what the problems and what the problematics are of listening uh, and and being in the space of others uh, being in their life world um, as uh, mentioned in that gracious introduction, Grayson, thank you. We, we also got involved with the Seaweed Society. Uh, there we are enjoying some seaweed and Mandy Quadrera's amazing work at IMA last year at the back. Um, and that uh, was a kind of um, opportunity to not necessarily need to have a program outcome, but be able to do this kind of like artistic and, and creative and scientific research together in different kinds of settings and places. Uh, and I know seaweed is not a plant. Um, it is plant adjacent, though, I would say plant friendly, and it's not the hugest leap uh, across to the algae from, from the plant world. Uh, but there are some plant purists who are like, you can't include seaweed in what you're talking about, Danny. Um, we do a lot of like looking at and playing with seaweed. Yes, that is a rice cracker with seaweed that the girl is about to look at with a microscope over there. Um, and then there's also this kind of idea of like trying to push um, seaweed to the front of a conversation where we are obviously you know needing to talk about climate change and needing to talk about uh, carbon capture um, and more, more sustainable modes of agriculture and so that project has kind of absorbed a little bit of some of the energies from why listen to plants um, on the other hand seaweed started to bring about a different turn in my uh, career. So I went back to Norway a couple of times in this period, um, was really delighted to be invited to the International Kelp Congress, where um, I was part of an artist residency. First time I'd been on a residency in about I don't know, 10 years as a, as a creative rather than directing it myself. And I discovered it was actually very nice. I really enjoyed being an artist. I really enjoyed making work. I enjoyed putting a score together for a performance with all the people from uh, the residency. Came uh, very naturally for me to get back into projection and light work that I had done years before that. And of course, all of the sort of like non 
human research and post-humanity stuff was starting to come uh, together in this work as well. And I found a lot of people in this kind of artist curator researcher space, uh, especially in the north of, of Europe, where there's a lot uh, kind of happening there. I am also mentioning uh, this and my, my next, um, some of the work, there's some of the little things we used in the projection and the performance. We sort of put the camera over the everything and uh, projected different areas around the space. Um, but then um, I got to this point where uh, it was early 2020. I was back in a way uh, as part of another project that I had sort of put together coming out of all of this, the Why Listen to Animals, Why Listen to Plants, as well as Seaweed Society, a uh, project called Non-Human University, um, where which is a course that can be as long as you like. In this case, it was a couple of weeks when we sort of had plans to make it a semester long uh, course. Um, and there's some of my excellent students who we went on a forage in this beautiful part of northern northern Norway. Uh, sorry, I know this is going to be loading slowly for you. I hope it's OK. Um, we went on this um, trip to see what might still be alive under the snow. And guess what? Uh, seaweed was one of those things, but also um, you find that the rocks there have a very strong energy reminding me of the program i never got to do why listen uh, to rocks or why listen to rock uh there's a sound art joke in there what happened after the non-human university well i got back uh to melbourne at the end uh in early march and i thought it was a good time to pack up my melbourne apartment um, and as we know, 2020 then kind of hit with a full force that we're still feeling now. Um, Liquid Architecture's program being very heavily dependent on live performance and events has now, you know, been changed forever over these last few years and the years going forward. I came back to the Gold Coast uh, and decided to sort of like regroup and think about where to go with this non-human research and work. There's a publication brewing for Why Listen to Plants. Um, and then I had an, an accident and I was in bed and I was bed resting and um, a colleague just said to me, you know, this is a pandemic and you've broken tailbone. Why don't you just do whatever you like? which was a really radical concept and I realized what I liked was what I was already doing looking at uh, plants I, I particularly started getting uh, obsessed again with orchids and endangered species uh, and I thought I might have a little crack at making electronic music so was something I could do in in bed with like, you know not using my body too much um, and the end result of that is that over the course of 2020 uh, while staying a curator and working on a, a couple of other curatorial projects I started making artwork again for the first time in a very long time but also uh, with this kind of idea idea of non-human subjectivity and, and Monica's research in particular at my at the forefront in zeroing in um, at this time on the idea of what plants um, feel and whether we should talk about that and how we could and what the ethical ways might be of doing that and I decided if we're focusing on uh, extinction and ideas of endangered species, then getting inside their head, so to speak, getting inside their feelings is prob probably the most important thing we could do. What do these plants want? What do they need? Uh, and so I started thinking about this swamp orchid, this very endangered swamp orchid, um, and what it wants most of all is to be left alone and not bulldozed and have its wetland drained and filled in, but also what it really craves is the rain, good thundering, you know, sky cracking open, you know, Queensland summer storm rain. And that became the basis of a big project um, that I did as a way of, of going into this beautiful orchid, the Fias australis. Uh, it's kind of going to be a a long-term project for me, made a lot of friends with gardeners. I got to drive out and visit orchid societies. Um, and uh, once the pandemic lifted and I was walking around again, um, started connecting with different types of people, ranging from scientists and rangers and tissue culturists through to uh, completely random folks who just happen to have a little greenhouse or have an orchid house or have a, a way that these plants have been um, kept alive. They might not exist in the wild, if they do, they're in so few spots, they're critically endangered and we should never tell anyone where those spots are for obvious reasons. Um, but there are quite a few of them now in the greenhouses of people who realise how precious and special this orchid is. It's very big. It's um, at least a metre um, and it grows in the ground and has these huge, big perfumed heads. Um, I was thrilled to be given an invitation um, to present some of this work at Bleach 
have to say a big, oh my God, so sorry, Bleach uh, 21. Um, really sad to hear the news today, not surprisingly, that the program isn't happening. Um, I'm very, very grateful to Bleach for the opportunity in 2020 to put my money where my mouth is and get this this plant listening, plant sympathy, plant feeling work out into the public. I made a kind of little garden with a, a sound piece uh, and some experimental lighting to kind of uh, bring about the, the feeling of this orchid in its uh, habitat and keep kind of commenting on the mixed uh, habitat mix environment we have here on the Gold Coast. Um, that uh, project has now grown into another project about what the Fires Australis wants. And believe it or not, what this orchid wants is for us to throw a dance party. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, it's going to be a bit more complicated than that. Obviously, it's informed by the kind of sub bass, the feeling, you know, the kind of organ rearranging deep sounds that you get with a really big sound system, um, part of dance, dance music culture, but also part of where sound goes from being something oral to something bodily or felt. Um, and it's also a way for me to tie in a kind of long running interest and connection with the deaf community. Uh, and so it's a collaboration with Auslan Creative and the Auslan Festival and the sound composition is being um, a collaboration between me and some deaf folks and particular amazing activist thinker, consultant, writer, Sigrid uh, McDonald, who um, is a really terrific collaborator on this project and someone who's helping me understand sound from a perspective beyond the, the you know, immediate audio, but those, all those other implications of it as a, something that is felt to something that has all these other kinds of presences. And that is, again, helping me to really expand the idea of the subjectivity of this plant. We uh, have moved that project into outcoming in 22, as so many projects are now doing and as are we doing. And then we're um, we're doing a reading group uh, called Slow Release over this whole next year period before the the exhibition and performance in the gallery with that that house party in September 2022. So we're going to visit wetlands. We're going to go to some places where regeneration is undergoing. We're going to have uh, lots of different little bits and pieces and workshops. Message me, get in touch if you are interested in Slow Release or in the Orchid House Party. Deaf collaboration, Lismore extravaganza for next year. Uh, but I'm happy to say that that uh, has been a natural extension of asking this question um, that has led on from why listen to plants. This question of what does what does this plant want? Uh, you know, what does this plant feel? What does it need? What's its rhythms and desires? And what can I uh, do about that? So um, that is where uh, my practice is at now. Thank you for listening to me. I think that went a little longer than we had planned. I'm going to go over from Cher now so that we can get back to the group. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much, both of you and and and, and Danny for that, that beautiful um, walk through really rich images coming out of many years of projects. And it's really great to see that, you know, um, at the core of it is a, um, a collaboration between you two, a great regard um, for each other's work. And it kind of leads to the first question, I think, like, um, you know, I, I really appreciate that, that, that set of images because it shows you this whole set of kind of a sensory apparatus that have been used to investigate plants in different ways. Um, and they they and it, and it opens up both a technical question: what are some of the tools and things that we might use to gain insight into X or Y? But also a kind of well, what does this sense this question of a sensory apparatus mean? What does listening mean? What does speaking mean? What you know? Yes. Um, and so I guess it, it it opens up a kind of a sensory and theoretical question. So so Monica, I'd I'd like to begin by asking you. You know, it it, it it's from Danny's talk, there's very clear sense of the ways in which kind of scientific inquiry, language and tools have given artists a way of inquiring into 
plant, plant life and cognition. For you as a scientist, you know, I would have to assume that there's a kind of similar process going on where the, where the theoretical apparatus of the arts and, and humanities gives, you know, gives you insight in your work and, and, and might change your practice. You know, when you talk about something like knowledge as a process, as an artist, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> knowledge emerges in the doing. Knowledge is not a thing that we hold in our hand. Knowledge is an experience. You know? <laughs> so that 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 for me is a core artistic insight that, that that you as an artist are having through your your laboratory process. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about yeah for you the 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 the, the insights that you gain in your work through the arts and humanities. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have become very aware that some of the things that, um, as a scientist, I I had to experience where for other fields of inquiry, uh, just the bread and butter. <laughs> and uh, it's been interesting because, um, of course, on one side is like, no, but you don't understand. It's like, uh, I cannot speak of knowledge as process. As a scientist, I, I cannot speak of that. And so for you guys, it might sound like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we've done this before. And for us, instead, it's like, uh, no, 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 knowledge is about the data. And the data are quantifiable units that we can put on a piece of paper or on a, on a laptop, and we can do stats on it and then get an answer for it, which is very clear. Usually is either or, or you know. So it's just a very different mind that is asking the question and is a different mind that is uh, searching for answers. And I guess in the in looking and learning to look at knowledge as a process, uh, it wasn't so much um, the mind was becoming extended for me. It wasn't so much about, OK, I'm going to have to think about this and then I can get it. But it became, and of course, like through Dani's beautiful um, journey that she just presented, it's very obvious that um, the mind is actually, the entire body is the mind. The, the mind is the, the experience of connecting the embodiment of different forms. And so in that sense, the apparatus includes the body itself of the scientist in the room, as well as the air that the scientist and the plants are sharing. and. And so, but this kind of, um, you know, this kind of conversation, I, I would say they are quite heretical still for science because what it means is that uh, there is no way to control. And what it means is as well is that um, the arts are a very good example of how to uh, reinvent the same materials that for science we're so attached to, they need to be working in a particular way. And, and I mean, even with this experiment that I briefly outlined, you know, I used um, materials like foam boxes and uh, perspex and, and plastic parts. And, and I, I, when the experiment started failing, and failure in itself is part of the journey because uh, the, even the fact that I should feel failure <laughs> is like, how can you fail? You're just searching and learning. So how can you fail? But we do because our training imposed the idea that as a scientist, if I'm a good scientist, I should know how to design an experiment that is going to work. <laughs> and uh, so failure is kind of not acceptable. Like um, it becomes a very personal thing. <laughs> and uh, but the materials, they like one day I was like in tears thinking of like, look at all this foam that I'm using and this plastic. And how do I how do I justify taking these materials which are so polluting? And yet I'm talking about, oh, the plants are amazing and they got these, uh, yeah, here is the picture that you can see of my beautiful foam boxes. <laughs> and, uh, and my beautiful colleague who is an ethnographer and actually it was in collaboration with, in conversation with Christy, uh, she's at UC Davis, that uh, I was able to crack open this head and see a bit more what it was that was bothering me, but I didn't have the words to, to verbalize. And so she came to work um, 
as an observer, basically, of the making of science. And so she was pointing out like, uh, wow, you know, look, uh, it, it, this is a very creative process to come up with like a maze that works with cameras, there is technology involved, there is, uh, yeah, that, it's a creative practice. And yet, you know, if my creation doesn't work, I feel like I'm failing. And so I'm already failing in the first place by thinking that there is a possibility for failure and by thinking that I'm the only one involved here, <laughs> I'm the only one responsible for this. And uh, which again is contradicting the, the very idea that I've been you know, writing about of plants as agency, as uh, subjectivities and as bodies that actually decide and choose and intelligence basically. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it was a very beautiful learning and also, at the same time, there was the issue of like, uh, how am I going to publish this now? <laughs> because, of course, I can't publish, oh, here is my failed experiment, and thank you so much, but I learned a lot. And uh, so, actually, Christy and I uh, decided to write exactly what happened. And the paper has just recently been accepted, and I'm very proud of her. She's so sharp, and she this is part of her PhD work. And... And um, and the paper is about, yeah, looking at the feeling of not knowing and what role does it play in the making of science, in the project production of science. And um, so, yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting because the materiality of in the real sense of like the materials that we use actually in this case, uh, made me decide to completely change the experiment altogether. And so I decided, no, no I'm not going to use these phone boxes anymore. And instead, I used it to plant like my own veggie garden at home so that I wouldn't waste them because then there is, of course, also that question of like, oh, so good that you're not using anymore the phone boxes. And, but the phone boxes are there. Again, like uh, the same way as you as the scientists are there when the experiment is taking place. So there is nowhere to go. There is no place where you can put the rubbish and there is no place where you cannot put yourself in. You are always present and everything else, everyone else is always present. So, yeah, lots of, uh, sorry, I think I lost track, but it's like uh, because uh, it still overwhelms me, the idea that... Um, how to translate this through uh, the, the really quite narrow edge that science allows. And in a sense, I'm very envious of the artists because uh, they can take exactly the same edge and then just uh, throw it away, throw it around, put it upside down and create amazing stuff that actually does bring up those questions the same way or perhaps even I would say in a more powerful way than I can do. So, um, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Spoke, spoken like an artist, Monica. <clears throat> Look, you know, um, I, I should have mentioned, by the way, audience, please, um, you have a and a function in your um, Microsoft Teams interface somewhere. I expect there's a question type little chat box thing. Please feel free to um, post questions or add comments for our presenters um, where we can see them as they turn up and are very glad to address them. Um, so so please don't be shy there. We're into the the, the, the freewheeling discussion part of, of, of the evening's um, entertainment. Um, I, another th something that comes up very strongly, I guess, really in both of the presentations, and again, this kind of concatenation of tools and, and modes of inquiry is the question of the experiment. You know, obviously the arts and sciences are very invested in, 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 in experiment and the experimental process. I happen to know this is also an area of expertise of my co-convener, Elizabeth, who has just finished an ARC Future Fellowship um, on this question and is no doubt burning with questions and comments of her own. So I might pass to Elizabeth um, for the, the next question or comment. Cheers. Thank you, Grace. And yes, indeed, I. 
absolutely wonderful presentations from both Monica and Danny tonight. And Grace is right. I'm dying to jump in and ask you a whole bunch of questions about experimentation and failure as well. But I'm also mindful because I, I invited people, Grayson, um, ahead of time in the chat to contribute their questions to the chat. And there are some that have been sitting there while, while you guys have been talking. People have been asking questions. So instead of, of taking my, my role as chair and the, the opportunity to ask the, the questions that I would like to, what I'm going to do is nicely turn to the questions that we have in the, um, in the chat function um, so that we can get to, we can draw in in our virtual way um, some of the comments from the audience as well. And in fact, the first question um, is precisely on the topic that you two were just talking about, um, Danny and Monica. Um, and so the first question that we have is from Luana Sky Davies, who asks um, that she would like to ask both Danny and Monica, whether you have any tips on art science collaboration and how we might work well together to create generative solutions to the accelerating loss of species that we are currently experiencing. Uh, experiencing. So do you guys have anything to, Monica, Danny, that's a question for both of you. Do you have anything to respond to that one? Danny, you go. Am I unmuted? Very, very slowly at my end. Um, Art science collaborations. Um, well, I, I hounded Monica while she was away on field research. And I was like, I know you're like in a tent with no Wi Fi, but can you please get back to me? I was, um, I think um, one of the hardest things is actually a really boring thing about just uh, trying to manage different types of schedules. Um, academics and researchers are, you know, incredibly busy. And when there's field work in there, it's very difficult. But it was also about working out the language across the collaboration. As Monica said, like, you know, the, it's so rigid in, in the sciences in particular, and there's so many protocols. And in the arts, is so it's often kind of the opposite. And we both have an idea of what it is when we're doing an experiment, but one of us can publish it and one of us can't. Um, my sister is a scientist. And uh, do you remember when I was doing research into experimental film that she kind of would snort and say, do you even know what an experiment is? <laughs> and, um, uh, and yet experimental in the arts is almost always a byword for the most cutting edge, the most important, the most engaged with critical uh, theory, reasoning, philosophy, contemporary developments in, you know, um, intellectual philosoph philosophical life. That's the expectation of contemporary art. Um, so, I, the, like Monica was saying, we can meet in the zeitgeist where the, we're, we're all interested in the non-human, but actually making the collaboration work. I'm so glad the the question of brought up endangered species because uh, I, I sort of feel like that is a ticking clock for all of us and personally, my, you know, where my career is going and what I have done to try to forge collaborations and I have quite a few now with scientists and um, normies, people who are not working in the arts. Um, one of those is about um, bringing other people into the collaboration, the general public, and trying to turn it further outward so you get maximum um, uh, kind of attention. I did a couple of radio interviews for Radio National and I've had lots of people connect in with me because it has so much reach um, and it connects outside the art world. You know, the art world's very weird. As science might be similar, echo chamber, lots of people feeling really good about where they stand on the issues, but not really necessarily being able to make those kind of broader uh, approaches. What do you think, Monica? I mean, you've done a lot of artistic collaborations. You've had the collaboration with Leah Barclay uh, for a long time now, amazing sound artist, um, and, and lots of other things. How, uh, how do you think we can make it work to generate uh, these kind of solutions that the question was talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, when I collaborate with artists, I feel um, I feel uh, free as well as like a totally inadequate <laughs> because there is an aspect. No, it's amazing because there is an aspect. Um, there is a kind of expectation that, and again, I should talk for myself, not for the the group as the scientist. But there is a kind of expectation, I feel, that um, we should be the expert with technology because science and technology seem to be paired often together, right? So 
uh, especially modern science is defined often by the technology that it applies. And yet, um, I find that the most incredible techie people are actually the artists who build their own technology and make up. And Leah Barkley is an amazing example of that. But there are many other artists that I worked with, like Cat Jones, and in, like to speak of the the Australian contingent, like <laughs> they are like geniuses. And he's like, uh, I, at that point, I'm like, yeah, I just know how to use the machine that gives me the spat out the number that I need, and it feels really like sad and like. But I guess then, and I think that is, uh, is actually the important part, is like uh, what I learned is that for me specifically, the um, because the language of science still has a very strong voice in our society, um, for me to be the, the one carrying the conversation outwards, on behalf of the team uh, of artists and scientists working together and, uh, and carrying it into uh, a forum or audiences that uh, they probably would never, as you mentioned, they probably would never really hear about it. Um, because I'm a scientist seems to give me a platform that allows for that conversation to be delivered. And so I kind of sneak in there both the my scientific understanding and then trying to do justice to the work of my colleagues as the artist and often what i find which is exactly what you pointed out as well dan is like that you know people the the general audience as we call it are actually very keen and very um ready to be involved and it's just, again, it's just almost like, no, no, but science is done in a particular way and maybe the arts do the same. No, no, you're not an artist, you can't have it. This. And, but the general audience is ready to play. And, um, and in fact, one of the projects that um, I've been cooking and cooking and it's uh, getting there, and it is, of course, involving Leah Barkley, <laughs> as always, um, it is about, it actually relies on getting people excited so that we can do this uh, work of regeneration. And, uh, and it's, it is using sound, it is using partly, you know, the scientific knowledge that we have already. And it's just, you know, it's a matter of putting it together in a new configuration that for some reason we haven't thought of. And I think the only reason why I'm able to see it is because I've been collaborating with people who look at the same things that I do differently. And so they allow me to have these insights as well into the same space that otherwise I wouldn't be able to recognize. So it's right there, but I can't see it. So um, I think that there is uh, not only plenty of opportunities, but it's almost like uh, we must, you know, like, please, people has to be involved. And I think this is one of the keys is like, uh, there is no one, no scientist or no artist or no whatever coming to save us <laughs> from like a, a total extinction of species, including potentially our own. It's like, we just say, like, you know, we say that you lift up your, your sleeves and you get to work. So if we're losing species, well, wherever you are, you apply the, the, your hands in place, which is actually, again, another important theme for me because, um, you know, situating yourself, no matter what your practice is. First of all, you're a human being situated in time and space. And so acknowledge that. And of course, that also connects with the acknowledging those that were there way before we arrived and, and started ripping up the place because there is a lot of, I would say, wisdom as well as knowledge that contains some of the solutions that we're looking for. And it's just that, again, it's a little bit like a, it's a, in my mini version of the self, my little self as the scientist working with artists and other disciplines and learning to uh, dismantle the science, not because I don't like science, but it's because science can grow too and can become something else and can reinvent itself too. Uh, I guess in a global uh, space is exactly the same. Everyone we are all here to be creative beings. So like everyone has exactly the same potential and all they need to do is to put their hands at work and don't be afraid that 
it's not called science, so this is not proper arts. It's like, uh, who cares? We don't have time. By the time we lost everything, who cares what your label was? <laughs> so just get the work done, and, uh, and if you have brilliant ideas, try them, play. But that's it. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. Um, we have another question here also, which a, a concrete question, um, one that may well be burning in people's minds. What equipment did you use to listen to the trees on the Gold Coast in 2018? And um, for me, that also brings up the, you know, this broader kind of apparatus that people have clearly been employing for many years to, to, to listen to plants. So maybe we could have um, Danny respond to that concrete question, and maybe then both of you could talk a little bit more about some of this technical apparatus, which has been you know, mustered in the service of listening to plants in many different contexts. You're muted, Danny. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just showing <laughs> a picture of what Leah, who's the one who did the sound, the tree listening project for us. Um, in this case, it was a two-part process where there was some kind of amplification microphone set up, set up in the tree itself, and then an app. The, the um, and it was more than one tree and there was a walk that you could kind of go on and so you could listen through headphones on your phone. But I'm not actually sure about the exact specifics of the technology Leah used there. What I can speak about is with the plant amplification world, if we think of that within the plant sound world, which is certainly, you know, the music by plants, the plants, the sounds they make themselves, that's generally a situation of sensitive microphones um, that then go through some kind of a processing so we can hear that sound ourselves and they're usually amplifying the transit of water nutrients or the actual plant's electrophysiology itself um, and so you do see you know what piezoelectric microphones look like a lot of people sitting around and they have little wires coming out of them they put them on people's bodies in medical settings um, and sometimes when they see the plant and it's all got these on it and it kind of looks like it's all wired up to some kind of weird uh, science fiction uh, thing is going to jolt it some um, artists actually put tiny fine needles into the stem of the plant uh, because that goes right into one of those channels so you get a lot more sound from it but I don't know if I feel like I could do that. Um, I feel bad enough even breaking off dead leaves. I'm like, sorry, plant. Um, but people, um, you know, again, it's like, it becomes a question, you know, if you can get more sound out of the plant. My favourite plant sound anecdote with the machinery thing is this artist, Christina Adel Shirley, who I uh, work with in Berlin, who is an amazing woman who travels to the gig with her plants they're her band so she's kind of comes in and she's got them under her arms so that she sets them up um, and plugs in all the microphones and attaches everything but some I asked her once I said like why do you have six or seven plants here you could kind of demo it with one couldn't you and she's like no because they don't all want to work on the day it's a bit of what Monica was talking about sometimes they just they're just like plant says no I'm not making sound don't care how much you poke me I don't care what you do to me I'm not making any sound today and then they'll make it tomorrow. Um, so that's why she has the, you know, lots of plants so that she can hopefully get some sound out of some of them. But she did tell me something, which was that they tend to make better sound if she makes them a bit thirsty first so they don't get a drink uh, for a couple of days and then they get a drink and then the sound is often them being like, yay, I got a drink again. And I was like, is that a little bit like, you know, dog training with Rick holding food and stuff? And she's like, they're fine. Um, given that most houseplants are overwatered, you know, and killed with love, I've kind of had to, that's one of those ethical places that I have thought about. But it's obvious if you are working with a electrical system like you can put those microphones on yourself and hear things for instance um um, so you you mostly get a series of kind of electric clicks and buzzes and pulses and it really is about what you then do with that to make it intelligible for an audience you can put it through different processing to isolate certain aspects of the sound for me um the sound of those bubbles that this is where the scientist was probably no better when I talk about the bubbles, a vascular kind of system of the plant has the way those bubbles uh, kind of travel. That sound um, is one that I've heard different types of artists amplify in different ways. And for me, the irregularity of it, not where it's a kind of sounds like a kind of organic 
um, electronic beat, but where it's actually like do, 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 it's kind of like much more free jazzy kind of sounding if you want to get to that. Um, but yeah, basically in a nutshell, most of that plant sound stuff. There are even things you can buy online and different kinds of like DIY setups to do it at home yourself. I have a couple of different uh, arrangements, but yeah, the plant also has to decide to come to the party and actually I kind of love it if they don't somehow, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> That's the privilege of failure though, isn't it, Monica? You can't love it if the plants decide not to, not to play ball. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, there is a big conversation in the arts about permission to fail though, because as much as we say that in the experimental world, you know, embracing failure and, oh yeah, I went to this gig and it was, it was awful and terrible and your friend says, oh yeah, awesome. Like experimental music is a very strange place to talk about failure in, but um, there's also questions about what's at stake. You know, scientists, you know, put so much time and effort into their experiments. And if they don't get a result that can, you know, that could be the end of their funding, that could be the end of their opportunities, that could be, you know, it, it's not recuperable in the same way it might be uh, in in the arts. That said, if Christina turns up at a show and the plants don't do anything, well, it's a good thing she has a whole lot of pre-recorded samples, but she won't be able to play live. And for some artists, you know, that it's hard enough when your um, mechanical technical gear doesn't want to work, but when the, pl the plants are not playing either, that would be tough. Does that answer the question as question? Sorry, I can't, I can't quite see them, so I can't answer. I just wanted to add one thing about that, Danny, you remind Monica, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to add like a, a comment uh, in regards to, well, there are lots of things there, but there were two particular points. One, um, the technical aspect of the equipment that is used and is connected for me to something else that you, Danny, talked about before in terms of the political power of the voice or voicing or silencing, which is the other side of the story. And, and, um, and I find that, you know, sometimes uh, there is this uh, almost um, violent, it's, it's, an, it's, um, it's an abusive desire of... Uh, of um, giving voice at all cost in our terms to those who might not want to collaborate you know like if a plant says they want to talk it doesn't want to talk and mm -hmm. you should respect that right so i mean in science of course we use all sorts of electrodes and we put needles through things all the time whether they're animal or plants and electrophysiology in plants is all based on these uh, like acupuncture needles basically they're really fine but still you're going through the system and and yes of course you're gonna get some numbers and some graphs that tell you but you already by doing that in itself you have already changed the very system that you're trying to describe so what are you describing now who is it really talking if anybody is talking there and so there is this problem for me of confounding the very voice that you're wanting to listen to by overlaying uh, onto this other basically your your own voice which is expressed through the noise there are oh, this is the voice of the plant and um which takes me to the the actual question of what kind of instruments would you use and and there are lots of little gadget on the market and I get contacted all the time like because they want to somehow I think many of these wants to have the validation that by science and he's like you don't get the validation by science from me but you don't get my validation like at the personal level because I find that a lot of these uh, like so sonification of uh, physiological data as you said is like you can put one of those piezoelectric stuff on you and you will get sound but if I said oh Danny that is your voice you will be not happy exactly <laughs> Because that is not your voice. What it, what that is is oh, it's your heartbeat or your blood flow or whatever electrical signaling that is being put to music, and that is very different than having a voice. And by putting something to music, if there was a voice they want they wanted to speak, there is too much noise and you can't hear anything anymore. 
So mm -hmm. what I've learned from my plants, so I will stay clear from those, although they are very fun. Actually, there is a darkness about them that I really don't like. It's so colonial and so abusive, I find that it's the same way I've, we have silenced many others, including other humans, other groups of humans for so long. It's the same process. It's just that we're doing it to plants and animals. And, and um, so I would stay very clear from those. When I started the, this work, I did explore those and I opened up those boxes and I asked the engineers to tell me what was in there and what was happening. And in the end, I thought they're fun. And yes, I can see the appeal, but it's almost like we really need to grow beyond this desperate need to put our voice onto others. And the only way to get her out of there, and in a way this I've, I have learned uh, from the indigenous people that I have interacted with, the elders that I have interacted with, not just here in Australia, but everywhere. The, there is one quality that I found. And again, of course, this is a big generalization, but they listen, they stop, they hardly ever speak a, a word while you're like, so tell me, tell me, tell me, that, you know, you're making all this noise and they're like, they just quietly listen because in the space that what they're listening to, a lot is being said. And I think that if we are really serious about listening to other voices, especially plants, but any other voice, silence is gold <laughs> and we really have to learn to listen and f create silence inside and avoid this desire of yeah making so much noise for entertainment because it's like uh, what does it really do in the end it's like, okay you you made a plan to play music and then what does he actually do it's again a, it feels like very self-serving that said, I have heard some beautiful stuff where the actual recording from, you know, the the water and the cavitation sounds like when plants get embolism because there is air bubbles in their system and those sounds paired up. So that is not they're not being covered or transformed or translated, but they're being paired up with sounds that we make. In our case, we make it then we call it music. And so, and when those come together, it can be really pretty, pretty and magical and groovy. And just recently I recorded some uh, trees here in the property where I live. And, and then just by chance, uh, I was talking to a friend and we decided to record <laughs> the sound of coffee coming up in the machine. Well, mm. when I recorded that and I slowed it down a bit, and I recorded the sound of the tree and I speed it up a bit. There is a place where those two are kind of not recognizable. So in a way, there is a place of silence where the different voices can actually meet and share something. And so I thought it was really intriguing that, you know, the coffee machine, which is such a human thing, you know, it's a, it's a thing that we create and, and, and it is a plant that is, uh, has been drunk over and over again, would be able to, uh, that sound can be connected by changing slightly the time and the space of that context and meet somewhere with the sound of a tree in my garden. So, um, uh, it's an invitation, I think, to slow down and truly listen if we are serious about connecting with these others. Mm. Absolutely. It, it's a great insight and message there. Thank you. So um, we, we're probably getting a little bit um, towards the, the, the tail end of our session. We've got a couple of other questions and comments um, over here. We had a couple of lovely comments, a lot of love for your presentations. Um, uh, so somebody talking about the experience of plants sitting on stereo speakers and, and the response of sounds again to, to, to vibrations coming through the system. Um, look, there is, there is a final um, question asking either or both of you. Um, I, I'd love to hear a, a, if either of you have a plant story that you could share which embodies the experience process of collaborating with plants. So maybe here's a little outro um, personal story to, to finish the evening. Oh, you can uh, um, 
You're going to love Monica's book, questioner. That's what the book's about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, she has so many beautiful plants in that in that book. Um, yeah, maybe I'll go first so Monica could speak last uh, because other than to say her read her entire book, my entire uh, life is a story of different relationships with plants. But for me, the fire Australis is the plant that has has uh, kind of literally pulled me out of the fog of injury when I was lying in my bed, uh, kind of a ground zero going, what do I even just want to look at? And at a certain point when I told uh, one of my friends that I was making a project of sound with this orchid, they were like, can't you just look at them like normal people? And I kind of get that because they, they do want you to look at them. But that orchid in particular, the stories that she has to tell about the Gold Coast when it was a swamp, um, the beautiful tea tree swamps that used to be here and um, that are, you know, now filled in and canals and living underneath those beautiful paper bark trees, the, the melaleucas. That plant for me, um, there's a special connection there uh, and it would be amazing to be part of a journey where it ends up regenerated back in our wetlands and even better, our wetlands end up protected from further development so there's habitat for future generations of that orchid. So I would say the Fias Australis, that one. Yes, the one you can see there with the bisexual lighting and the, the blue and pink and purple. Um, that, that's her in full bloom last year. Um, and I'm proud to say she had three babies. So um, that that's my Fias and that's my plant story. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> um, well, I can see from the chat, the, the question was asked by Marinda Davis, who I know and I've been like waiting to connect properly for a collaborating project with her. So um, it's really beautiful to see that you're here. <laughs> and uh, oh, too many stories, too many stories. I think at the moment, um, there, I have some plants who uh, are just big, companion and they keep staying with me and actually again Danny you perfectly uh, put it before during your presentation I am very aware that I am not one but I am a multiplicity of of beingness here and um, so there is a plant at the moment that is uh, been calling my attention and it's been interesting to slowly because it's a big tree and it seems like, a, you know, it's a slow relationship. We are getting to know each other slowly and it's the Cajarina tree. And um, and yeah, I had a couple of conversations or she decided that, you know, she had stuff to say and and so uh, I'm learning a lot from this tree at the moment. But um, I guess I feel really bad to just, uh, you know, say, oh, this is the one now, because I can, <laughs> all the and others are like, but what about me? What about me? I've been with you for so long. So I think that okay. I, what I would like to share is something, something slightly different. I went to a meeting and I met this, uh, this person that invited me to this meeting in Sydney. Um, it was a couple of years ago now. Uh, you know, I arrived late at the meeting, so uh, the meeting was already starting. I snuck in from the back of the room, sat quietly and tried not to make any noise. Uh, at the end of the, of the conversation and discussion and everything, I approached the person that so kindly invited me uh, to apologize for being so late and saying goodbye and thank you for inviting me. And this person, um, instead of looking at me in the eyes and looking at me as we are used to do, especially you know uh, in the in Western interactions, uh, because I know that that's not the case for everyone, um, it was it was looking down and it looked up and down and it, it looked at almost like it was trying to avoid looking at me. So I thought, oh well, you know, maybe he's upset or whatever. And then naturally I received an email like the next day and he uh, he wanted to apologize and he said to me, you know, I just I'm really sorry, but I could not look at you because what I could see was that your face changing over and over again. And he looked like and he didn't know anything much about my work, uh, like he hadn't read my book or anything. So it wasn't like, oh, 
And then he said, I, I kept seeing all these, it looked like your face was turning into different plants. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't look because I, I couldn't focus. And, uh, and when he said it, I felt inside an acknowledgement of all the plants that they are here, that I worked so closely and as my teachers that, yeah, we, we are a collective and we come and move around and learn in different ways. So even when I speak of the Kajarina at the moment, it's us that goes and talk and listen to the Kajarina. And uh, so, yeah, those relationships can be very deep. And in some of them, uh, I would say, can even surprise us on the depths that the human can can go to in terms of like, uh, yeah, the again, the embodiment and materiality of the relationship that it becomes, it makes you, it becomes you, it builds your body every day. And I only eat plants, so yeah, I am totally vegetal. <laughs> You're That's very plant-based. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe before we close, sorry, can I just say one thing? I did not pay Danny for <laughs> all of the promotion that he did, like, oh, and a book, and it's like, hey, Dr. <laughs> thank you. I, you know, I gracefully uh, received, but it was quite embarrassing. It's like, I didn't pay anything for this. So. But thank you. Your work is amazing and it's really great to share the space again. Oh, it's so good to share the space with you and thank you for all the inspiration and the what your the gift of what your publications and what your research has brought to, to the whole world, Monica. You know, we're, we're so lucky to have you here. <laughs> she continues. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, look, thank you both for that wonderful talk and interaction. Um, it's a great pleasure to share the evening with vegetal beings um, and, 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 and to, to celebrate this. Um, I think we've probably come to a close. Um, I really want to thank, um, I think my co-convener, Elizabeth, Thank you for your presence and assistance and everything in, in putting together the series. Thank you so much, Sarah and Brent and Hoda, for um, supporting the talk. And our, our technology, after our tests, which I have to say, audience, our tests were um, long and complex and, and full of myriads of problems. But I think this whole thing has settled down far more nicely than, than it was like, you know, two hours ago. So um, <laughs> thank you, technology, and thank you, Hoda. And thank you, Danny and Monica, again, for, for, for a wonderful talk and interaction. Thank you to the audience. Um, that was really enjoyable. Really, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs> thanks, everyone. And thanks, Grayson, too. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Grayson. Yeah.